what are the what are the criminal penalties for possessing? Not they're really not for using, although I guess if you want to split hairs, you can't use without having it, so you're in possession of it. But um, but how do they? Uh, what are the gradations of criminal penalties, right. and do so they shift from state to state? They're hugely different from state to state, particularly if you look at the law in the books. I mean, there are still states that have prison time for possession. I don't think they do it in real life, mm -hmm. um, but they're pretty, still pretty ferocious laws. Uh, most of the people actually go to prison, go to prison for dealing. Hard to tell how many that is. Probably something between 20 and 40,000 people behind bars at any one time for crimes defined by cannabis possession or sale. Some unknown number behind bars because they were on probation for their cannabis possession or for something else and tested positive on a probation drug test and where their probation was violated or their parole was violated. Um, in any case, it's not a substantial fraction of the incarceration problem. It's not a substantial fraction. Right. right. Yes, it's, I know. You know, it's one or two percent of the people behind bars. So that's really one of the bigger myths I, I was thought that yeah. was circulated that you could be on death row for a marijuana seat in your backpack. I no. exaggerate, but this idea that the that the jails are just brimming with people with a joint in their pocket. Right. But if you look at all arrests in the United States, there are about 12 million arrests a year. 600,000 of those are for simple marijuana possession. So that's a... But they're not incarcerated. They're not going on to be incarcerated. Well... I mean, some are, I suppose, but... Well, there's, there, there, there's, there's several things, right? Some of those are what are called non-custodial arrests. Basically, the cop hands you a ticket, right? We shouldn't count those, but the statistics do not distinguish between custodial and non-custodial. Some fraction of them are custodial arrests, right? Handcuffs, ride downtown, fingerprints, jail overnight while you're awaiting your arraignment. Mm -hmm. I don't know the science here, but I would bet you that the average overnight in jail has a lot bigger health impact than the average event leading, leading to an, an emergency department mention. Right? I mean, that's... Well, it's unpleasant, that's for sure. It's unpleasant, and, you know, in some cases it's catastrophically unpleasant. I mean, there are like suicides in jail. And well, no, and there are suicides in jail. Um, but in addition, you've now got an arrest record, which has all sorts of socially debilitating consequences. Um, I, I think I, I'd call that the, the single biggest downside of prohibition. Uh, well, 40 million people every year who break the law, many of whom don't break other laws, uh, that's not good. $40 billion in illicit business, which is really not good. And then, you know, 600,000 arrests, heavily concentrated, socially downscale and in minorities. Uh, no, it's, this thing is broken. Um, the notion that we could maintain cannabis prohibition really doesn't pass the giggle test. We, we are where we were with alcohol in 1930. And I'm frustrated that the people like me who are very concerned about the public health consequences of an unwise legalization are fighting legalization as if that's a battle that's either winnable or should be won, as opposed to fighting for a sensible form of it. And of course, the people who are fighting for legalization just want it in any form at all and tend to naturally downplay the health risks. So it's a, it's a frustrating situation where there's, you know, so fool, fools to the left of me, jokers to the right, and here I am stuck in the middle with you. I mean, with me, yes. Exactly.